some of the biggest challenges that have to do with the practice of Christian worship and leading worship and congregational life in North America and around the world have to do with questions about worship and culture. Culture is ever-changing. Most of us live within several subcultures at the same time. And all of us desire to have worship practices that are connect deeply with our local cultural context and at the same time to be strengthened by historic Christian practices and the rich teaching of scripture to ensure that our worship is faithful and biblical. As we have reflected on these issues of worship and culture, uh, both in North America, where we are located, and in contexts uh, around the world, we have been helped tremendously by a document entitled The Nairobi Statement on Worship and Culture, produced by the Lutheran World Federation. It's a beautiful statement in part because of its simplicity. It makes four basic claims. All Christian worship should be transcultural. That is, there should be elements of worship that are common in Christian experience no matter what cultural context we find ourselves in. Christians all over the world, in every ethnic group and throughout history, have always prayed the Lord's Prayer, offered prayer in Jesus' name, read scripture together, preached and heard sermons that proclaim the gospel of Jesus, celebrated the Lord's Supper and baptism. These and other transcultural elements are important to understand deeply and to practice. Second, the document um, suggests that all Christian worship should be contextual, should be responsive to the local dynamics of a given time and place. Local cultural contexts make a great deal of difference about the dress that people wear when they come to worship the dress that leaders are expected to wear, the accent that people use, the register of the language that is spoken, the meaning of gestures, the range of emotions that are expressed, and not least important, uh, the sense of uh, length of a worship service, which varies tremendously by how a culture perceives time. Third, the document contends that all Christian worship should necessarily be countercultural. The Apostle Paul reminds us that as Christians, we are not to be conformed to the world, but to be transformed by the renewing of our minds. Christian community life stands as a countercultural witness to the power of the gospel. And in every time and place, it is important for Christian communities to stand in countercultural resistance to aspects of a local culture that are at odds with the gospel. If a, local, if a local cultural context is consumerist and is consumed by greed, the Christian community should provide an example that stands over against it. If a culture is by nature superstitious, prone to think that its own actions can manipulate God in some way, the Christian community stands over against that protesting. If a local cultural context is uh, deeply unjust, the Christian community stands over against that, proclaiming and living into the view of justice and a concern for human flourishing found at the heart of the scriptures. And fourth, the document contends all Christian worship at its best should be cross-cultural. In Christ, we are members of the body of Christ, which span generations and spans cultures from one time and place to another. And when we worship, we should sense our solidarity with Christians in different times and places. And we should seek to learn from them about practices of worship, practices of proclamation and the celebration of the Lord's Supper, baptism, music, and prayer, practices which can enrich and strengthen our own practice, as well as to have the opportunity to share insights that, any, that our own congregations may have learned along the way. When we worship cross-culturally, and when we worship in congregations that themselves seek to be multicultural communities, we remind ourselves that the gospel is not contained in any one culture, that all of us have a great deal to learn from other cultures. Each of these four claims, it's important to add, are grounded in the person of Jesus Christ. 
Jesus Christ comes to all cultures. Jesus lived as a representative of one culture. Jesus became a Jewish male. Jesus came uh, in order to protest aspects of cultural expression in his own time and place that resisted uh, his uh, announcement of the coming kingdom. He threw money changers out of the temple in a prophetic act of resistance. And Jesus came ministering cross-culturally, ministering, for example, to the Samaritan woman in John chapter 4. In Jesus' own life, we see each of these four embodied. And what was true for Jesus Christ should also be true for the body of Christ. What's so beautiful about these four claims, though, is that they give us a holistic vision that call each of us to be accountable to each one of these four criteria. As I teach in uh, congregations uh, and in contexts throughout North America and beyond, I'm often struck by how in one context we insist on the contextuality of worship. In another, there's an emphasis on worship as a countercultural act. In another, there's a great emphasis on cross-cultural worship. But the four are really not a multiple choice test. Rather, they are invitations to uh, imitate Jesus in all four ways, embodying a transcultural gospel in a cross-cultural and countercultural way, in ways that deeply connect with the particular time and place in which we are privileged to live and to serve God.